My name is Jane Doe, an undergrad student. My identity shall remain anonymous to shield me from stigmatization. After my rape, people often asked me, what was I wearing? My name is Busi Hori, a mother and academic. I often wonder why, after the end of a marriage, the responsibility lies solely on the shoulders of the woman. My name is Salami Mbata, a postgraduate student. During the bereavement process, I note that women are required to observe various practices like sitting Shiva. They are also required to perhaps shave their heads, whereas the men are able to mourn as they choose. My name is Tersha Jacobs. I'm a grandmother and administrative officer. During my formative years at school, we were often told not to study too hard because our only role in life would be to be somebody's wife. My name is Wissal Domingo, Dean of the Law Faculty. In 2017, I penned an article about my experiences as a Muslim female black professor employed in a historically white institution. And finally, as per the introduction, my name is Leonie van Amerva. I am perplexed that sexual reproductive rights, as well as our access to sanitary pads, are policed by males more stringently and more strictly than they police issues such as crime, corruption, fraud, state capture, rape, and murder. I also am perplexed that people tell me that I am calm, logical, and measured for a woman. Who are these women? These women are me. I am these women. These women are Beyonce, Mojaji, Charlotte Makteke. These women are Malala Yousafzai, Tarana Burke. Our shared experiences of inequality and the associated intersectionalities connect, disconnect, and reconnect us all at the same time. So the global expansion of movements such as hashtag Time's Up, I'm with her, men are trash, as a means to protest sexual assault, misogyny, and the patriarchy are indicative of a new feministic dawn. So regardless of our income, our location, our language, our culture, ethnicity, pregnancy status, one thing is a universal truth. Women experience varying ranges of inequality, regardless of those factors. So what is feminism? Who are these women that hate men? <laughs> Are feminists those, those ghastly women who burn their bras, walk around naked and free bleed? So you'll hear me use the analogy of the patient feminist today who requires medical care and attention. And as I say that to you, I want you to think in your mind about your diagnosis and your prognosis for your internal feminism, your feministic voice. Is she dead? Is she critical but stable? Also, is she very healthy? Does she do 10,000 steps on the Vitality app every day and drink green juice? It's also a possibility. Is feminism dead? And when you listen to feminists speak, what often comes to mind is a whole lot of jargon. So you'll hear terms like lipstick feminism, raunch culture, mansplaining, that's my personal favorite. You'll also hear terms like heteronormativity and cisgender. So it's also important to understand the impact 
that language has in our understanding of inequality. Language is the lens through which we perceive everything. It allows us to communicate, it allows us to share our culture, share our joys, give feedback. Language also allows us to listen. Language, culture, power and identity are intertwined. And according to Eckert, Eckert tells us that when it comes to femininity, we associate femininity with the denial of power, whereas we focus masculinity on affirming power. And in a country with 11 official languages, it then becomes clear that language and its associated culture can either become our shackles or our keys. Language dictates the speed at which we move along the spectrum from Miss, Sweetie, Poppy, Baby on the one hand to Slut, Whore, but she asked for it and what was she wearing on the other hand. In conjunction with language, we also consider the waves of feminism as being important. The waves of feminism serve as landmarks in our feminism journey. So it's not uncommon to hear someone say, she is a second wave feminist. She is a third wave feminist. So the first wave of feminism can be traced back to the 1830s. And during this time, all women wanted was the right to vote. They wanted equality in education, property rights, contracting. What they also wanted was a voice. The first wave of feminism culminated in what we today know as the suffrage movement in the United States of America. Then moving on to the 1960s, women became bolder. Of course we did, right? And so what we wanted was, we wanted to focus on more controversial issues. Sexual reproductive rights, women at work. The second wave of feminism is also important because it opened the door for women of color and women from developing nations into feminism discourse. Looking at the first and the second wave, those waves propelled us into the third wave of feminism in the 1990s. This is important because the third wave of feminism built on the work done during the first two waves. But it also focused on issues such as the assertiveness and the power held by women, as well as gender stereotypes. And that brings me to the highly contested and debated fourth wave of feminism. So some people say that the fourth wave of feminism doesn't exist, but there is a converse view that from the year 2012, mechanisms such as social media, globalization, and popular culture have propelled us into a deeper focus on transgender rights, sexual harassment, as well as issues such as rape culture, body positivity. And as an intersectional black woman existing in a pluralistic democracy, I have a few questions about feminism myself, right? First question, why are feminists unable to reach consensus about certain things? The answer is perhaps as simple or as complex as is palatable to society. Intersectional beings with intersectional realities require intersectional solutions to the intersectional problems. So on the one hand, as a society, we can't promote inclusivity, diversity, and intersectionality, but then deny women of their rights to equality simply because of diversity in thought. The second question, is there a place for feminism in South Africa? So I want you to imagine a woman living in rural South Africa with no access to running water or electricity, who is perhaps unemployed, financially dependent. Maybe she's exposed to gender-based violence or HIV prevalence, and always remember that she will always be exposed to the cultural norms within her particular community. 
What this then means is that the fact that this particular woman isn't well versed in feminism discourse and theory doesn't render her inequality any less valuable than my experience of inequality. So in South Africa, our particular challenges, such as gender-based violence, illiteracy, HIV status, poverty, the legacy of apartheid, white fragility, white privilege, those issues have given rise to various branches of black, African, and South African feminism. Next question, and this is my personal, my personal favorite question. Why are feminists so angry? So I'll speak for myself. I'm not the spokesperson for, for females. And I will say that perhaps I am not angry. Perhaps I am disappointed. I'm disappointed that I have to work twice as hard to be viewed as half as competent as the person next to me, just by virtue of the existence of a Y chromosome. And that brings me to the reason we are here, our patient feminism. What is her status? Is she critical but stable? Is she deceased? Is feminism obsolete? The fact that we ask these questions is indicative that we as a society are willing to grapple with what is right and wrong. It is also indicative that we are reflective and that we are evolving. So to answer the question, while our patient feminism has undergone a facelift of sorts, and she requires extra care and attention, as we all know, her heartbeat still goes for equality. Her scar tissue is stronger. Her skin is thicker, tougher. Her vital signs are positive and raging for change. Each of the women who have kindly allowed me to utilize their stories in my introduction have perhaps been our patient feminism at some point or another. The stories of inequality have been diagnosed, dissected, resuscitated, placed on life support, and then discharged. Jane Doe, Busi Khori, Wissal Domingo, Tersha Jacobs, Salami Mbata, Leonie van Amerwa. While our backs bear witness to just how sick, ailing, fragile, infected certain notions of feminism in South Africa can be, our connected stories of inequality perhaps also indicate to us that it is better to be a sick, ailing, fragile, tired, angry feminist than to be no feminist at all. Thank you.